थ्री टू वन सर वी आर लाइव नमस्कार एंड गुड इवनिंग एवरीवन आई वेलकम यू ऑल फॉर टुडेज वेबिनार ऑन लंग कैंसर मैनेजमेंट 2020 विद इमेंस प्लेजर आई वुड लाइक टू इनवाइट डॉक्टर राहुल सूद हु इज कंसल्टेंट मेडिकल ऑंकोलॉजिस्ट कमांड हॉस्पिटल बेंगलुरु फॉर द वेलकम एंड इंट्रोडक्टरी नोट एंड टू सेट द बॉल रोलिंग ओवर टू यू सर थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर द काइंड इंट्रोडक्शन so uh, i have been given this uh, opportunity to introduce today's topic which is on lung cancer so why lung cancer and uh, the answer to this is why not lung cancer because lung cancer happens to be the commonest cancer among males in india it is the third most commonest in females in india and if you see the mortality that is the death because of lung cancer it is the highest in the males as well as the females so it is a very very important and pertinent problem and as we go forward we see that more and more cases of lung cancers come into being this is mainly because of the smoking though it has gone down in the male population but it remains a problem in the female population initially when the lung cancer started it was the squamous cell carcinoma was which was predominant but our studies have now shown that now the adenocarcinoma is the commonest cause of lung cancer in india when we started our practice in oncology we found that the only way we could treat lung cancer was either in the form of surgery radiation or chemotherapy more so in india we find that majority of the cases of lung cancers which we encounter come in the advanced or the metastatic stage that is the cancer would have already spread beyond the lung either to the bone or to the brain or to some other organ like the liver or the adrenals so therefore majority of the cases that we come across are the stage 4 cancer or the metastatic lung cancers the treatment paradigm for metastatic lung cancer used to be only chemotherapy which was a, a platinum based chemotherapy cis platin or carboplatin with either pemetrexate or with gemcitabine or paclitaxel but what the problem we used to face was though there used to be some initial response but there was an always a lacking response that was seen in the individuals that is majority of the times the patient used to just relapse or progress even while therapy so that's this was a major problem so what we started was molecular testing in lung cancer that is to find molecules to find targets which can be easily easily targeted uh, by some form of therapy therefore the treatment of lung cancer started to shift from chemotherapy to targeted therapy the first target that was found out was the egfr or the epithelial growth factor receptor which played a major major role in the proliferation of the cells of lung cancer thereby also causing dissemination of lung cancer so this was a potent potent target which should have been blocked with with the advent of the egfr we found that there were molecules that were developed which were anti egfr in the form of first generation dkis or the tyrosine kinase inhibitors like gefitinib and uh, uh, lotinib going to the then to a, the next version that is the second generation tkis like the afatinib and the uh, uh, dacomatinib and then finally the best uh, tki that we find in our practice that is the third generation tki which is the osimertinib these alone or in combination with, chem with chemotherapy have changed the paradigm that is not only the primary was being controlled but also the metastatic site so over a time period the lung cancer has evolved many folds and there are so many updates that we get get uh, every day so it is pertinent on our part to know about the updates in lung cancer what are the changing paradigms which are there and what are the best drugs that is there so i will kick start today's uh, today's uh, evening on lung cancer by these few words 
I hand over to the organizers to set the ball rolling and introduce the speakers. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for your beautiful insights. And without taking much time, I would like to introduce the first speaker, the first talk for the day on the topic lung cancer management, what physicians need to know. And the renowned speaker is Dr. Narayanan S., who is a rank lieutenant colonel and pulmonologist at Command Hospital, Bangalore. Over to you, sir. Hi, uh, thank you very much uh, for your uh, kind introduction. And thank you, Dr. Rahul Sood, for uh, uh, a wonderful prelude on uh, the lung cancer. Mine is a very important topic, uh, which is about diagnosis of lung cancer. As you all know, uh, in our country, with tuberculosis uh, remaining very pre uh, prevalent till now, it is a great masquerade for diagnosing lung cancer because it is easy for a physician to start a patient on anti-tubercular therapy, especially when he finds any opacity in the lung, which is persistent. Since there are overlap between the symptoms and signs of both lung cancer and tuberculosis, the physician is, feels easy to start an ATT, labeling the patient as mere negative pulmonary tuberculosis. And giving an ATT means you're fixing a diagnosis for a patient for the next six months. If you don't follow up the patients, you delay the diagnosis of lung cancer for the another six months. With this introduction, I'll start presenting my slides. There are over 2 million people diagnosed with lung cancer each year, and one out of five diagnosed people will be alive after five years of diagnosis, which means key, approximately one out of five cancer deaths among the total cancer uh, subset is lung cancer, and every minute three people die from lung cancer. This statistics is from Globocan, which is a platform, the web-based platform the WHO has introduced wherein uh, all countries are supposed to register their patients. I mean, it is not compulsory, but they have a database wherein they present the statistics. This is of 2018 vintage. It is not uh, very old. So out of one out of five patients will be alive after five, uh, five years. And the leading cause of lung cancer, I mean, uh, cancer that's across the world is lung cancer. So this is Global Can 2020 data. Total number of lung cancer incidents in the year 2020 was 88,831. Among the total, among those uh, deaths of, the total cancer deaths, around 80,000 people died of lung cancer alone. And with around 9.3% is the incidence per death of lung cancer. The less patients diagnosed at earlier stages, not to blame anyone, the patient presents to you uh, late only because the symptoms as he starts coming in only after stage two, stage three. By the by the time the patient presents to you, uh, he is already in stage three or stage four. So when you compare males versus females, the statistics doesn't differ. Uh, around thirty to forty percent of patients present to you when they have undergone a local regional mix. Most of the patients, both males and females, around forty five to fifty percent present to you when they have already got a distant metastasis. So what is the tumor classification? How do you classify lung cancer? You have broad classification is around uh, small cell lung cancer and non-small cell lung cancer. The most common is a non-small cell lung cancer, which is around 80 to 85 percent. Among the non-small cell lung cancer, around 20 to 25 percent is a squamous cell carcinoma. As already Dr. S uh, Rahul Sood has said, uh, adenocarcinoma forms around 40 to 50 percent of out of the non-small cell lung cancer and large cell carcinoma is around 10 to 15 percent other types like a carcinoid a salivary gland tumor and alveolar cell carcinoma all those other types a sarcoma uh, forms the other uh, types of cancer which are not very common coming to the presentation of lung cancer we already discussed uh, the presentation is quite similar uh, to an anti, uh, I mean, uh, tuberculosis, a persistent or deteriorating cough and hemoptysis, hoarseness of voice or wheezing when the RLN is involved, a fatigue, weight loss, a dull aching chest pain or a pleuritic chest pain, a breathlessness on exertion and loss of appetite, pretty much same as tuberculosis. 
A diagnosing lung cancer is pretty important. When you suspect a lung cancer, you have three modalities, three broad modalities where you can go ahead and diagnose. One is do an imaging, a CT scan. I mean, the first is a chest X-ray, then followed by a CT scan, and then a PET CT scan if it if it is indicated. Thereafter, you go and sample the tissue because you need to classify as to which head the patient goes to. I mean, a non-small cell lung cancer or a small cell lung cancer, even if it is a non-small cell lung cancer, especially when the targeted therapy has come in, you need to identify whether it is adenocarcinoma, squamous carcinoma, or an adenosquamous carcinoma. You have to go ahead and do still perform an immunohistotyping, and thereafter a fish or a gene sequencing to identify whether those mutations which Dr. Rahul Sood spoke about exist in the patient or not, because the treatment, the management differs when the patient is classified into one of these diagnoses. So a uh, laboratory tests include all those which I have already said. So when you diagnose lung cancer, you can go ahead and do a needle biopsy when the uh, lesion is peripheral present in the peripheral one third of the lung. If it is in the central one third, the medial one third of the lung, go and do a end of uh, bronchoscopy, take a tissue, brush biopsy or a cell block doing a bronchial wash. And an EBUS for both diagnosis and staging of lung cancer, when if the center has got EBUS or most of the centers now has got an endobronchial ultrasound. So why the cancer is being, lung cancer is being diagnosed late? Misdiagnosis most of the times as the symptoms to mimic the other respiratory diseases. In our country, tuberculosis is number one. Now with COVID and post-COVID symptoms have started setting in, we have more of the patients with uh, more patients with a diagnosis of COVID and then on follow-up, they are being labeled as a post-COVID symptom rather than investigating them for a lung cancer. A lack of screening in high-risk patients, especially patients who are reformed or ongoing heavy smokers. You need, you need to have a screening protocol in our hospital, but we don't have anything. And lack of awareness, of course, on patients. So patients with warning signs and symptoms of cancer were misdiagnosed as tuberculosis to the tune of around 20%. This paper came in from All India Institute in the year 2009. So 4.03 months were the uh, patient was on anti-tubercular therapy. Thereafter, these were the median months the patient, uh, the physician took to diagnose a lung cancer. So it, to the tune of 20%, 20% was misdiagnosed as tuberculosis despite the warning signals were present. The mean age was around 58 plus minus 7 years. Smokers, 12 out of 14. Smoking pack years of more than or equal to 44. So across India, these are the various studies right from uh, Karnataka, Uttarakhand, Tamil Nadu, Jammu and Madhya Pradesh. So uh, these studies also said the same thing. The number of patients misdiagnosed were to the tune of around 23% to around 43%, where in Jammu it was around 43%. The median diagnosis to the symptom delay was around uh, three months. So what is the solution? So awareness is the solution. You, to create awareness to the physicians treating a chronic lung disease is the solution. And of course, the patient comes next, the awareness to the patients. So AKT should not be started. That is the bottom line without confirmed diagnosis. Any chronic uh, respiratory symptom with any opacity in the lung, it is easy, very easy to label as tuberculosis and start the patient on ATT. We have to restrict ourselves, especially when we don't have a microbiological diagnosis. If the sputum is negative, we need to go ahead and take a sample. As I said, the medial one-third lesion should go for a bronchoscopy or a peripheral one-third lesion should go for a CT-guided FNAC oblique biopsy before the patient is being started on ATT. You need to have a tissue oblique microbiological diagnosis before the patient is placed on ATT. Because once you start ATT, you are delaying the diagnosis for about approximately four to six months. Careful monitoring should be done in all those who are smear negative and despite all investigations, if you go ahead and start ATT, please do follow these patients, I mean, every month, if not every two months. Consider lung cancer as a differential diagnosis, even if the patient is a never smoker, especially when there is a persistent opacity which do not resolve with the anti-tubercular therapy. So lack of screening in high-risk high high patients, we'll speak about in the next coming slides. It is not existent in our country and lack of awareness is also an issue. Symptoms include cough, hemoptysis, fatigue, patients more than 50 years of age, smoking history. So, I mean, these are the symptoms of lung cancer. So screening techniques for lung cancer, you can have go ahead and screen them in a chest x-ray or a sputum cytology or a low-dose CT scan. Chest x-ray is very non-specific with, uh, I mean, there are studies which have been done on screening techniques with chest x-ray, which didn't show any mortality benefits. Sputum cytology, again, it is a 
difficult thing to do you have to induce a sputum especially when the patient presents here with the dry cuff and the lab has to be uh, trained in diagnosing uh, uh, malignant cells on a sputum cytology again not recommended not useful low dose ct scan yes what is the evidence uh, the low dose ct scan before going on to the evidence i'll just tell you it is around 20 uh milli ampere seconds uh, i mean 25 to 40 milli ampere seconds conventional would take around 115 milli ampere is just the uh, i mean the x ray film dose i mean the ct scan dose and seconds is the amount of period of exposure of the patient so it produ produces satisfactory image quality of course better than the uh, chest x ray reduces the ct dose index and that thereby maximally protects the patients from a radiation exposure hence preferred for multiple scans as needed So this is the lung national lung cancer screening trial published in the NEGM in 2011. The study was around 50, I mean, included around 53,000 patients between year 2002 to 2004. They were uh, uh, divided into two subgroups. One was uh, made to undergo a chest X-ray. Second was uh, to a low dose CT scan, and you can see the results. Relative reduction in the mortality was around 20 percent, which is quite significant with a p-value of less than, I mean, equal to 0.004. So NLST found that for every 320 low dose CT scan administered, one life could have been saved compared to 864 tests for a colorectal cancer, which we go ahead and do colonoscopy for all those patients. Uh, between 645 to 1,700 scans for a breast cancer. So this is the uh, uh, Nelson trial, which was done in the Netherlands and uh, Belgium. Uh, this is high risk patients that are smokers more than 30 years of i mean more than 30 pack uh, pack uh, years of smoking and more than 55 years of age undergoing screening at baseline i mean t0 and uh, year 1 year 3 and year 5.5 versus no screening follow up of 10 years the cumulative rate ratio for death for lung cancer at 10 years were around 0.76 with a p value of equal to 0.01 again very significant so nccn came up with this lung cancer screening guidelines based on these two trials they were divided into group 1 group 2 i mean uh, high risk group a moderate risk and a low risk high risk group 555 to 77 years with more than or equal to 30 pack years and group 2 involved around more than 50 years and more than equal to 20 pack years they recommended that uh, the candidates for screening shared patient oblique you have to discuss with the patient and the patient physician has to discuss and arrive at a decision I mean, discussion including a discussion of a benefits and risk, and a low dose CT scan if the patient agrees is always recommended for these high risk groups. Moderate and low risk, uh, the lung cancer screening is not recommended. The risk factors: smoking history, uh, secondhand smoke exposure, family history of lung cancer, occupation exposure, rate, radon exposure, cancer history. Especially a patient with COPD is again more prone to lung lung cancer even if you remove uh, the smoking risk as uh, for as a cause for lung cancer. so a physician play an important role in the early di the diagnosis of lung cancer especially in patients with respiratory symptoms not responding to antibiotics in our country anti tubercular therapy chronic smokers a family history of lung cancer and a cautious reading of chest x ray even a 5 to 10 second uh, extra time in looking at a chest x ray in a busy opd schedule especially when the patient has got more than 30 pack years of smoking is fruitful in diagnosing those small those small lesions which are not visible when you just look at an x ray so screening identifies suspicious nodules less than 5 mm you can always uh, i mean uh, and these are flishner society there are flishner society guidelines this is a general guideline 5 mm or uh, nccn guidelines 5 mm or small next dose ct should be uh, low dose ct should be around 12 months 6 to 7 mm in 6 months 8 to 14 in 3 months if it is 15 mm or larger it is always recommended to do a pet ct scan also in addition to probably doing a tissue diagnosis either with a ct guided thing or a bronchoscopic technique so early treatment we all know it early treatment will lead to better uh, uh, survival if you diagnose the patient in stage 1a1 the five year survival is 92% vis a vis stage 4b it is less than 1% you can see the declining five year survival rates uh, when the patient progress is higher in his stages so issues to plan yeah i'm just concluding is the issues with lung cancer screening is no screening guidelines for smokers again we need to develop uh, institute based guidelines they depending on the case load for non smokers also and of course smokers at least a chest x ray spending a little more time on a chest x ray is important cost effectiveness again is debatable especially in developing country like india you need to discuss with the patient the solution is uh, having a robust screening guidelines each institution can have its own guidelines and physicians be aware of the patients 
they can refer for, refer for lung cancer screening lack of awareness you need to discuss with the patients and create awareness these are the various societies in india creating awareness the way forward is we have already discussed a good artificial intelligence based algorithms can detect a better uh, can detect better those uh, opacities than a human eye both in ct and chest x ray and thank you very much for uh, make, giving me this opportunity questions will be take answered at the end of the uh, presentation thank you thank you so much sir and i request everyone to post their questions in the chat box so that we can keep the track of time uh, now i would like to invite the next speaker dr prasad narayan from bangalore dr prasad is a senior consultant medical oncologist at site care hospital bangalore and the topic for his talk is newer paradigms in rejected egfrm early lung cancer over to you sir hi uh, good evening am i audible visible yes sir yeah so uh, i thank dr rahul for this opportunity and uh, thanks specifically to include the first talk actually because we uh, usually our meetings we don't discuss the basics things and it is important to know that as well and to discuss that as well actually and the awareness that uh, uh, many patients are missed because of uh, uh, as assumption of covid at all is so important so i will be focusing basically on a set the a paradigm shift which is uh, which has happened in the treatment of resected egfr mutant early lung cancer so we heard about this uh, about 85 percentage of all the lung cancers are non small cell lung cancers as rahul and our previous speaker has explained to us and my specific uh, topic that is one third of these patients if you take stage 1b stage 2 and stage 3a where we treat with accurate within stage 1a hardly we see they present with a resectable disease so and still in this group of patients who undergo a curative within treatment the cure rates five year recurrence rate is around 45% in stage 1b 62% in stage 2 and 76% in uh, stage 3 which means that we need to achieve go a long way in terms of curing these patients really in the in a meaningful manner and any treatment which can actually help in this regard is welcome so we have uh, uh, gone through the treatment different types of uh, uh, options and the, the main focus of today's talk will be the egfr mutant group so when you look at the different stages of cancer we know that egfr mutant lung cancer there is a uh, huge improvement by treatment with the uh, egfr uh, and egfr therapies and the prevalence of uh, egfr mutation is almost similar in all stages which is important stage 1 2 3 4 across the asian us or european population it is similar as uh, in different stages so definitely if we have an egfr and egfr based therapy which can actually be tried in this group of patients and that can result in a better outcome that is always welcome that was the basis of uh, the adora trial which will be the topic of discussion today from my side which looked at osimertinib as adjuvant therapy in the curative intent uh, treatment of egfr mutation positive nsclc so it's a very uh, simple design uh, curative intent uh, lung cancer patients all should have exon 19 deletion or l858r uh, mutation and these patients uh, should have undergone a complete resection with negative margins and if the patients had uh, adjuvant chemotherapy which almost 60% of the patients in the study had the randomization should be within 10 weeks and if it was uh, without adjuvant chemotherapy it is 10 weeks and with adjuvant chemotherapy to include that within 26 weeks stratification based on stage and the type of the mutation and race were given 3 years of osimertinib 80 mg per day or placebo and the study was designed to with an assumption of a hazard ratio of 0.70 with disease free survival as the primary endpoint so it is important to note that the assumption was that we will get a hazard ratio of 0.7 i am saying this because we will see what happened in the study so inclusion criteria pretty simple inclusion criteria straight forward inclusion criteria 
And the baseline characteristics, if you see, the male-female ratio, age, the smoking status, ECOG performance status, zero and one, then uh, the adenocarcinoma versus others, EGFR mutation, the type, and adjuvant chemotherapy were equally balanced. So uh, well-balanced study in both arms. Uh, large study, 600, uh, almost 700 patients with 315 each arm. So this was the primary out uh, endpoint. That is the uh, disease-free survival. If you take overall population on the right hand of the, uh, uh, on the screen, the hazard ratio was, uh, I don't have to say the hazard ratio because it is so, uh, significant, the curves are so wide. Hardly in any solid tumor study, especially in the adjuvant setting, we get this kind of curves actually. So the hazard ratio, which was expected to be uh, uh, for positivity 0.7, it was almost 0.2 in the overall population. It was a definitely positive study. And there was an interim uh, analysis because of the uh, improved outcome and the, uh, the, the data was presented. And if you take the slightly higher stage, that is stage 2 and stage 3A, it was even better. There was an 83% reduction in risk of disease recurrence or, or death, the hazard ratio being 0.17 in this group of patients. So the study definitely met the primary endpoint. And this is uh, the two-year DFS. It was consistent for OCMR stages in stage 1b 88 percent stage 2 91 percent stage 3a 88 percent which means that uh, regardless of what is the stage of the disease the benefit of giving uh, oc mertinib definitely is there across the stages in this group of patients and the subgroup analysis when we look at it uh, there is nothing to choose actually there is no single group of patients who did not benefit it is a clear benefit towards the uh, test arm the oc mertinib has uh, has demonstrated better outcome regardless of the different uh, different subgroups the, based on whether the EGFR mutation, which type was, or whether patient received adjuvant chemotherapy or not, or the stage Asian, non-Asian, etc. This is the overall survival curve. It is not a mature curve. So I don't think we have, we can discuss much about that. We will not discuss about the hazard ratio of this curve because uh, the overall survival is not mature. And we hope that with this much improvement in the DFS, we should get an improvement in overall survival. And with the present generation of uh, adjuvant therapy approvals, I think it is a straightforward decision to approve this treatment in EGFR mutant patients post-resection. Now, to give a background and to say how important this uh, data is, we can look at the other studies, actually, because this is not the only EGFR and EGFR therapy which came. So we were keenly looking at these studies when they were happening and they got published, the Erlotinib and the Jefitnip studies, because the magnitude of improvement in resected lung cancer with chemotherapy is not very big. And we all thought that if you are giving an anti-EGFR therapy for EGFR mutant patients, we may improve survival over chemotherapy. But these studies, whether it was uh, erlotinib or jefitinib had never shown an improvement in DFS in EGFR mutant group. And that is the importance of the ADORA study because, and that is precisely why the expectation was to get a DFS improvement with the hazard ratio of 0 0.7 and we got an, an improvement of around 0.2, 80% improvement actually. So another thing is about to look at the type of recurrence. So local and re regional recurrences are associated with a longer post-recurrent survival in any cancer. And CNS definitely is one of the common sites of distant recurrences. If you look at the adjuvant study with uh, uh, erlotinib, 37% of the patients recurred in the CNS. And we all know that osimertinib is a significantly better drug to uh, in, in CNS-positive patients and it prevents CNS uh, disease in advanced patients as well. So in the ADORA study, the type of recurrences where distant recurrence was seen in 61% in the placebo arm versus 38% uh, when we use it in the, in the osimertib arm. So definitely distant recurrences are much less when you use osimertib. And you do specifically take the CNS recurrence, which is our area of interest, because CNS recurrences is almost uh, 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 with detrimental outcome 
uh, in in a patient regardless of whether there are single met or multiple metastases so there were very less cns occurrences it was uh, one percentage versus 10 percentage uh, with oc martinet and if you see all the cns dfs events overall uh, 45 patients and six in the oc martinet and 39 in the placebo harm had cns uh, recurrences so cns recurrence rate is much less in the patients who received uh, oc martinet and that is shown in the curve as well so safety summary uh, oc martinet uh, definitely is a very safe drug uh, we all have experience in using in advanced cancer and this study in the adjuvant setting also proved the same. Uh, if you take any adverse event, it was not much of difference between the osimertinib versus the placebo. And uh, let us look at the specifically the grade 3 and 4 toxicities. Hardly any grade 3 and 4 toxicities we can see. Grade 1 and 2 toxicities, diarrhea, the GI side effects were the predominant ones which uh, is seen with the most of the EGFR TKIs and osimertinib is no exception, but it is not grade 3, 4, so it is manageable. The other one, the QTC prolongation, grade 1 and 2 interstitial lung disease, these are all seen in small percentage of patients and not nothing much to say about the safety. It's a safe drug in this group. Now, uh, let us look at the chemotherapy use, whether uh, uh, there was a difference in the patients who received chemotherapy or not. From the forest plot, we know, but this is a separate analysis and a publication which came out of that. So 60% of the patients received adjuvant chemotherapy in both the arms. Majority of them received platinum-based therapy, mostly the ones who had stage 2 or stage 3 ATCs. And in stage 1B, only one-fourth of the patients have received adjuvant chemotherapy. So uh, what is the difference in uh, DFS with adjuvant chemotherapy or without adjuvant chemotherapy? The impact of osimertinib is, is there regardless of the uh, whether the patient received adjuvant chemotherapy or not. 89 percentage versus 49 percentage with adjuvant therapy and without adjuvant chemotherapy, again 89 versus 58. So the impact of giving osimertinib post chemotherapy or if the patient doesn't get chemotherapy is there and EGFR mutant patient definitely should be discussed about this option of treatment to improve the DFS. And uh, if you see uh, with, uh, if you take this stage wise uh, grouping and see with and without adjuvant chemotherapy also, everything is in favor of osimertinib in this study. So, uh, this is a graphical representation of the same statement in stage 1b, stage 2, and stage 3a. Regardless of whether the patient received adjuvant chemo or not, there's an there's a improvement in outcome by adding osimertinib. Now, when you have an adjuvant study and we have this kind of DFS improvement, another question that will come will be the quality of life. So this is the quality of life uh, publication. So there was uh, this was based on a uh, health-related quality of sur uh, uh, survey assessment. And 85% of the patients actually uh, completed this survey, which is important in an adjuvant study where there were around 700 patients. That is important because that gives us more information. Now, the quality of life uh, survey did not, there was no deterioration in the uh, physical or the mental uh, assessment. Uh, there was no reported de deterioration by giving adjuvant osimertib in this group of patients. So health-related quality of life was uh, equal in both the group of patients. So in summary, uh, adjuvant osimertinib, the first targeted agent to show a statistically significant and clinically meaningful improvement in DFS in stage 1b, 2, and 3a EGFR mutant lung cancer patients. There was an 80% reduction in the risk of disease recurrence or death, which is significant statistically. And the two year uh, DFS rates were 89% versus 52%, and the curves were widely separate. So that is why it is uh, clinically also meaningful. And there was an improvement in the CNS DFS as compared with placebo. The safety profile was consistent. And uh, it was regardless of the role of uh, whether the patient received adjuvant chemotherapy or not, the health-related quality of life was maintained. So in summary, adjuvant osimertinib will provide a highly effective practice-changing treatment for 
stage 1b 2 and 3a egfr mutant lung cancer after complete tumor resection and that is the new standard of care in this group of patients thanks a lot Thank you so much, sir. For the next talk, I would like to invite Dr. Murli Subramaniam from Bangalore. Dr. Murli is a senior consultant medical oncologist at HCG Hospital Bangalore. And the topic for the talk is establishing OZ Martinib as SOC in the management of EGFR positive and NSCLC real world experience. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, am I audible? Slides are visible? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Thanks, Dr. Rahul, for the uh, invitation. Uh, Prasad, you have set very high standards like Virat and uh, probably Rohit Sharma with hazard ratios of 0.17 and 0.1, 0 0.20. Very high standards of hazard ratio. Uh, uh, that's the magic of osimertinib uh, uh, in the adjuvant setting. Uh, let's uh, let's move on to the uh, metastatic disease, where actually this drug was initially approved, and then slowly now we are seeing its benefits even in the adjuvant setting. The, the whole topic of discussion would be on the real world evidence of uh, uh, osimertinib in EGFR mutant uh, metastatic lung cancer. Uh, uh, the, the background is the uh, FLORA trial, as we all know, that was the pivotal trial, uh, which, which brought in the approval for uh, usage of osomertinib in first-line metastatic non-small cell lung cancer or EGFR mutant. So, and as we have discussed, EGFR osomertinib is an irre irreversible third-generation EGFR TKI. From the FLORA trial, uh, what confirmed was an improvement in the median progression-free survival, 18.9 uh, versus 10.2. The comparator arms were erlotinib and uh, jeftinib, erlotinib at 150 and jeftinib at 250 mg, and uh, a benefit in the median overall survival of 38.6 for the uh, osimertinib arm and 31.8 for uh, patients receiving the comparator uh, EGFR TKI. So this is the background study FLORA trial, which is the uh, pivotal phase three trial based on which uh, the uh, osomertinib was approved in the first line uh, setting. Uh, we quickly run through the key inclusion, exclusion, and how the study was uh, conducted. Uh, it is very important to look into the pivotal study before we go into the real world experience. Here the key inclusion criteria is what we look at is the performance status was zero to one. So most clinical trials will have stringent inclusion exclusion criteria. So hence, uh, not all the patients will actually benefit from the drug. So you're looking at uh, specific mutations at exon 19 deletion and 21 L858R mutation and uh, uh, stable CNS metastasis was allowed in the study. It's a simple uh, randomization, one is to one, with osomertinib 80 milligram daily, versus the comparator at jeftinib 250 or erlotinib uh, 150 milligram. Uh, OS was the key secondary endpoint and PFS was the uh, uh, principal uh, endpoint. So if you look at the baseline characteristics, they were well matched for sex, age, race, CN, CNS metastasis. It's very important. Only six to seven percent of patients had uh, CNS metastasis. Uh, but we all know that in practice, we do see more number of patients with CNS metastasis. That's why that's how this uh, real world data helps us to understand how this drug works, uh, even in those patients who have. Uh, with poor performance status also. Here, WHO performance status zero and one were allowed. And only EGFR mutation 19 and L858 are allowed. So 
a forest plant. Of course, this forest plant doesn't look as attractive as the one which Prasad presented with hazard ratios of uh, uh, between 0.1 and 0.2. However, nevertheless, nonetheless, this is a metastatic uh, setting. Uh, this drug should benefit in virtually all uh, segment of uh, patient population right from age being less than 65, greater than 65, Asians or non-Asians, whether the patient is smoking, whether the CNS metastasis is present or not, <clears throat> whether the PSC is zero or one. So irrespective of any of these, all, all patients started to benefit, uh, giving a median PFS of 18.9 months versus the comparator arm was at 10.2 months. So this was the uh, analysis on the overall survival. The median OS was at 38.6 versus the comparator arm was at 31.8 with a statistically significant p-value at 0.046. So conclusion, so this was the pivotal flora study which, which, which actually brought oscillatory in first line um, as a first line EG for DKI monotherapy to show a statistically significant OS and PFS benefit uh, in those patients who, who, who harbored a uh, uh, EGFR mutation for exon 19 and L858 are uh, mutations. So, uh, of course, there, are, there is always uh, restrictions from the pivotal trial because of the strict inclusion exclusion criteria. Based on, based on this study, this, this study was approved as the uh, uh, frontline therapy as a preferred option in EGFR mutant for those who, uh, as, a, as an initial therapy, or in those patients who already chemotherapy has been initiated, osobatinib can be started after completion of uh, chemotherapy. So how do we look at the real world? Many times we won't get patients who exactly fit into the uh, inclusion exclusion criteria of what we see in the uh, FLORA study. Uh, so there are three published uh, uh, study uh, for uh, osomartinib in this clinical setting, which is the flower and the OSI fact and myconos, which actually kind of gives us confidence to go outside the inclusion exclusion criteria for which is actually there in the flora study and gives confidence that even in the most poor prognostic uh, patient, this drug actually works. So first we look into the flower study. This again, uh, this is this uh, sorry to intervene. Yeah. Your voice is not at all clear, sir. I'm on Bluetooth. Is it is it audible? No. No, it's fine, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's fine. So uh, this is an introduction which, which basically talks about the uh, flora, the flora final uh, final data. It also shows that only two to four percent of patients with cancer received treatment with randomized controlled trials. Thus, uh, raises, raising a pertinent issue of representativeness. Are you representing all the patients? So this real world data uh, have become useful tools to assess unique insights uh, in routine oncology practice in the post-marketing setting. So it gives us a broader horizon of the molecule uh, outside the inclusion exclusion criteria of the trial. Now, the, this study, there were 126 patients, um, which looked at uh, uh, the median age was 68, brain metastasis was present at 30% of diagnosis, and then uh, st stage 4A was 23% and 4B at 71%, and uh, bone metastasis at diagnosis was present in about 45%. So the best response to osomatinib in this study of 126 patients uh, is a partial response, which is uh, around 73%, stable disease at 23%, 5% or 4% of patients actually progressed in this uh, real world study. So these were the key inclusion exclusion. So the standard inclusion exclusion criteria, 3B and 4 were included, EGFR, uh, one or more EGFR uh, mutations in like some 18 to 21. So the uncommon mutations were also in, were part of the, were included in this trial. And there was slightly different endpoints uh, compared to the flora. They used uh, uh, an endpoint called TTD, MTTD, which is basically uh, median time to 
discontinuation of osomatomate therapy. As we all know in clinical practice that uh, a radiological progression, especially when there is an oligometastasis, very minimal asymptomatic progression, we tend to do some kind of local therapy and then continue with the TKIs, osomatomate, and thereby you actually end up giving uh, these TKIs longer than uh, actually the patient would have received in the clinical trial. So TTD is an actual uh, exploration of this uh, uh, pragmatic real world endpoint rather than a radiological resist progression, which is actually looked at in the clinical trials. So the primary response, uh, uh, so patients with poor performance status, comorbidities, rare EGFR mutations, active. So most of the patients in the FLORA trial should have a stable CNS medicine. Here, patients with active brain metastasis were also included. This is actually an exclusion in the flora term. So outcomes from this study were similar to the published data, thus adding consistency to the osomatinib efficacy. So that, that gives a lot of confidence to us that the published data, which is actually in a restricted population, is actually, uh, which can be used for an extended, uh, uh, extended horizon. So there was no difference in the PFS, TTD, and OSS were noted in elderly patients, patients with comorbidity, and even in the less common EGFR mutation. The biggest doubt or challenge we had is what happens if we have uncommon mutations? This drug actually works in real world experience, even in those who had uh, uncommon mutations. So the primary assessment, if you look at the effectiveness time to treatment discontinuation, that is 3TD was, median was a 25.3, Whereas the PFS in the flora was around 19.19 odd months. So you get this additional four to five months of benefit. When you look at time to treatment uh, discontinuation, it was at 25, 25.3. If you look at from two other important uh, points, that is one from uh, a, in a symptomatic versus an asymptomatic, the median TTD was not reached in an asymptomatic patient, whereas it was at 18.8 months for a symptomatic patient at diagnosis. If you look at less than three metastatic sites at diagnosis, uh, the, the, the TTD was not reached for, for those with less than three, but it was at 21.4 months for those patients who had uh, more than three metastatic disease sites. So uh, uh, this is the conclusion of the effectiveness. So outcomes were similar to the published data, uh, thus adding consistent to the Osomatinib efficacy. So the uh, TTD was longer, uh, like 25.3 months, than the post progression outcome analysis of the flora. Flora was around 20.8 months. This gave an additional five months benefit in a, in a real world uh, experience. So, uh, so it also gave additional insight that who are the possible patients who are not likely to do well because. This, this trial is a real world experience used more patients with poor prognostic features also. So, and it did give three important insights that patients who harbored, who had a lot of symptoms at diagnosis or had more than three metastatic sites at diagnosis uh, or those who had brain metastasis, those are the patients probably they're kind of having poor or a negative prognostic factors. If you look at this, uh, symptoms at diagnosis, uh, uh, the hazard ratios were uh, was a 3.48 with a p-value of 0 0.04. It was a negative prognostic factor uh, as far as uh, treatment uh, failure, uh, early treatment failure is concerned. Uh, similarly, for patients with metastatic disease sites, more than three, a diagnosis also have, was a negative prognostic factor. And those who had brain metastasis at diagnosis was also a, uh, a proper prognostic factor. So uh, this is a repeat like the, the, in terms of the response rates, uh, PR, the best response was PR at 73, stable disease at 23, and progressive disease 4%, comparable with the uh, initial published data of uh, FLORA. So uh, uh, if uh, the, the, the PFS of uh, uh, median PFS was 18.9 months in the trial, whereas uh, PFS for patients who had brain meds was 13.3 months. 
this was also consistent with the FLORA study. And those patients who had uh, initial symptoms had a PFS of 15.5 months. All these data were comparable with the initial FLORA study. So longer PFS, in a multivariate analysis, a longer PFS was noticed in the absence of brain metastasis. The median was not reached versus 13.3 uh, uh, 13 months. So prolonged PFS uh, and longer OS was also noticed in patients without symptoms and diagnosis. So not having symptom in asymptomatic patient or not having brain metastasis, these patients tend to do, tend to have a longer PFS and an overall survival. Uh, a TTD of nine months or higher was significantly associated. If a patient had a TTD of more than nine months, that patient uh, had a very high probability of having a better overall survival uh, with a p-value of 0 0.008. So uh, what happens at, uh, at progression? This is also an important thing. So among patients experiencing progressive disease, which is the numbers in this study, 44, 21 cases underwent a re-biopsy at progression, tissue biopsy in about 14, and then liquid biopsy in about six. What they found was MET amplification in four, MET and EGFR in one, EGFR amplification continued, EGFR amplification in one, and HER2 amplification in one. It's also kind, kind of gives an insight into what are the possible mutations, uh, resistant mutations, and what kind of therapy can be planned in the post conservative progression. Safety in conclusion, Prasad has elicited this. Uh, we have seen the adjuvant of uh, data from the Adura. It's a very safe drug. Nevertheless, there are some uh, pulmonary toxicities and uh, rash, uh, uh, skin toxicities. Uh, the one thing which has come out from the real world data is the incidence of venous thromboembolism. This is not much spoken uh, in, the, in the flora as well as the Adura. So, uh, uh, venous thromboembolism rates were, was very common and it was commonly encountered. Uh, there were no specific factors which showed that which patient is at risk for uh, venous uh, thromboembolism. So the uh, numbers were around 10, uh, amounting for about 7.9% of patients. Uh, there was no difference in the rates of venous thrombosis was reported according to age, PS, comorbidity. So it was not clear as to who, who was the patient, who were those who were actually developing this venous thrombosis. So this is an important insight from the real world data uh, showing that uh, age, uh, PS, comorbidity did not impact on the venous thrombosis. So there is no difference in the survival outcome was observed according to age, comorbidity, and type of EGFR mutation. Osamertinib confirmed efficacy, effectiveness, and safety in the real world scenario. So, so this is very, very reassuring uh, in, from, from a point of uh, usage of this drug for uh, poor prognostic uh, group patients. So the second study was the OSI FACT. I will quickly run through. This is the, again, the, uh, introduction from the flora, uh, the standard inclusion, advanced EGFR positive NSCLC with osomertinib as initial standard exclusion criteria. Uh, the baseline characters, if you look at here, uh, I think uh, uh, stage two, a few of the stage two patients are also invol in, uh, involved in the study. It was a study of 538 patients, uncommon mutation compromised about uh, 5%, that's about 30 patients in the study. And then there were ECOG PS3 and 4, ECOG3 were around 4%, ECOG4 was 0.7%, ECOG2 was 11%, ECOG011 was almost 80 to 85% of patients. So these are, the, these are the standard baseline characteristic of the patients. Patients were also looked up for, from a specific point of view about uh, the PDL1 from the PDL1 uh, status point of view, also. The study endpoint primary was PFS, secondary was OS, time to treatment failure, and documenting the response rate and the safety profile. Last so you know, yeah, so I'll conclude. The, I'll quickly run through the median PFS was 20.5 months, identical to the flora, flora study. There were 
182 events out of the 538 patients. So uh, interesting to note that there were some uh, 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 some parameters which had some negative prognostic factors, for example, uh, the male gender, presence of malignant effusions, liver metastasis. If you have a very advanced uh, unresectable case, these were probably uh, kind of negative uh, prognostic factors. With respect to PDL1 expression, the median PFS was not reached in those with CFT with a TPS score of less than 1%, and it was 14.7 for less than 49, it was 11.1 .1 for those with more than 50%. So uh, if you look at the, as I was saying, the, there were a few negative prognostic factors, that is the presence of effusion, liver metastasis, uh, these were some of the negative prognostic factors from the study. Uh, discontinuation profile, if you looked at, many of the patients discontinued actually because of uh, disease progression, about 45%, 25% actually uh, discontinues uh, uh, because of progression of other diseases. Uh, progression because of AEs were, was less, was very less. So safety profile, uh, again, uh, uh, similar to the safety profile as we have discussed, pneumonitis is one concern. All grades, most of the uh, uh, the safety, uh, most of the A started at, at about median duration of 56 days. So our conclusion: the oral response rate from this real world study was about 76 percent. The disease control rate was 94 uh, percent. The median time to treatment failure was about 19.1, comparable with the flora. The medium time from the start of treatment to the onset of AE was 56 days, ranging from 5 to uh, 565 days. Pneumonitis of all grades occurred in 69 patients, that's about 12%. Grade 3 or higher was seen about 5%. So this is another study which is showing that the uh, PFS after first line of symptomatic in the real world practice was uh, favorable and discontinuation rates due to AEs was, uh, uh, was very less. The third study was published from the US. I'll quickly run through. There is very little time. Uh, this is an ongoing study, actually. Only one, one part which from the US has been published, which is a real world experience, uh, uh, which this uh, the study inclusion started around Jan 2000, uh, around April 2018, and then the insulin analysis, June 30th, and the uh, the patients are continued to be recruited even till now. Patients will be recruited till June uh, 2023. So, uh, the, so here the assessment was to generate estimation, a similar treatment to um, uh, treatment of a uh, discontinuation of osamatinib was the primary endpoint. The, here, the, the most important point was even the uh, uh, stage one patients were also included probably. Uh, one to three, uh, about 16 16 percent of patients were in early stage. Uh, about uh, 80 percent were in stage four. So uncommon mutations were also part of the study. Uh, uh, I'll just quickly uh, show the interim analysis. 318 patients were on first line osimertinib therapy. This was a 500 odd study. 103 patients received second line treatment. 101 patients died on the first line treatment. 26 patients, about 5% of them discontinued the first time. So this was the 17.9 uh, months, which is comparable to flora, is the median uh, TTNTD, which is nothing but the next treatment, uh, median time for next treatment or death. So uh, it also gave an insight onto the uh, negative prognostic factors, higher stage of diagnosis, smoking, smokers, and the Charles, Charlson morbidity index of more than three, and uncommon EGFR mutations and number of metastatic sites being more than four, they were all considered to be poor prognostic uh, uh, factors. So, so some of the take-home messages from the study, this study, this study provided some real-world insights to use of first-line osimertinib. Uh, the interim data uh, results supported the effectiveness of osimertinib in the real-world. Uh, Long-term outcomes will be evaluated in the final analysis. Thank you. I had to rush through the last two, but I think it is reassuring to see that this drug works uh, well in the, uh, in the poor prognostic uh, features like poor performance status, even with CNS metastasis, higher stage, even in all these, this drug uh, works very well. They, uh, this is a fantastic drug uh, 
fantastic job in this city. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. It was a much elaborated talk. Uh, we'll gonna help the budding oncologist for sure. Next, we have a panel discussion. And the panel is on, it's a case-based discussion, managing a metastatic EGFRM and HCLC. And will be moderated by Dr. Rahul Sood, who's a consultant, medical oncologist, Command Hospital, Bangalore. Uh, may I have the honors to be, uh, invite the panelist also? Dr. Abhay Kumar, consultant, medical oncologist, Manipal Hospitals, Bangalore. Dr. Smitha S. Saldana, associate professor, Kidwai Hospital, Bangalore. Dr. Lipakshi K., senior consultant, medical oncologist, Redon Cancer Center, Hubli. Dr. Mansi Khanderia, medical oncologist, NH Hospitals, Bangalore. And Dr. Rudresh A.H., associate professor, Kidwai Hospital, Bangalore. Over to you, Dr. Rahul, sir. Right. Thank you. I hope I'm audible, visible. Yes, sir. Slides are also visible. Right. So I think we have a full house here. I, I can see everybody uh, over here. And uh, I'll really appreciate if uh, uh, they can switch on their videos uh, so that we can have interaction uh, subject to, obviously, the network uh, connection. So uh, uh, the main purpose of uh, doing the panel discussion here is to uh, see the experiences that we all have and also to share these experiences. So the panel discussion is going to be very, very simple. And it is a day-to-day -day kind of work that we do. But there are so many things that we keep forgetting and keep missing amidst probably the rush in the OPDs or preoccupation. So let's revisit it, revisit lung cancer and stage four lung cancer as we go forward. So uh, the case history goes as, as a 54-year-old male who was a former smoker, diabetic, good PS, presented with a pleuritic chest pain and shortness of breath for a period of one month. Oops. Okay. Right. So uh, the uh, CT scan of the individual was done after doing an X-ray. The CT scan was suggestive of a large low pulmonary mass. And also he had right adrenal gland metastasis. So a biopsy was done, which confirmed it to be an adenocarcinoma. So a lucky chap, though he was a smoker, was found to have an adenocarcinoma. Unluckily, it was stage four because of the metastasis. And uh, the histopathology was subjected to an EGFR uh, testing. And it was found to be EGFR positive for exon 21 L858R. So uh, my first question, and uh, I'll go in the order in which uh, the names have been given. I'll start with Dr. Abhay. Uh, Dr. Abhay, in your practice, uh, what uh, do you subject the patient straight away to just an EGFR testing or an NGS? Or uh, what is your practice? Do you do an EGFR and cross and or do you do an NGS? Dr. Abhay? Am I audible? Yes, sir, you are audible. Initially, yeah, so initially I, what I will do is I will do a liquid biopsy. So I will send for the EGFR testing and simultaneously I will do NGS testing on a tumor block. Oh my God, this is a something new and something. So why so, Dr. Abhay? Uh, uh, why a liquid and, and, a, and a solid? To, uh, why, why do you do that? Initially, see what did AstraZeneca used to do that on uh, T7 and T1 mutation from liquid biopsy that is free, of course, they used to do so. That's why I wanted okay. to use that one. All right, all right. Okay, Dr. Smita, uh, uh, what do you do in such a patient? So, usually we send for the EGFR, AL, CROSS, and uh, PDL1. This is upfront. Right. Off late from the last uh, few months, we have an in house uh, molecular lab. So, we are for few patients sending for NGS. But All preferably right. NGS is the ideal way, but most of us get it hotspot because of the uh, limitation of the cost, financial cost. All right, all right. Uh, Dr. Lee Pakshi. Yeah, it's same, sir. I will do easier for all cross one and PDL one. Okay. These four okay. markers are different. So, Dr. Lipakshi, do you start the patient immediately on treatment? Or do you wait for this report yeah, to if, come? If the, if, see, this patient is 54-year-old. 
I think wait. So I will start with chemotherapy because I don't want to wait for the reports. So right. if any additional information I will get, I may add EGFR TK if it comes as EGFR positive. So only right. thing is whether MRI brain was done in this patient. Just I wanted to know. Right. So I I will go to that. We that that's as we go forward. That's a question I've kept on the side. Uh, so Dr. Mansi, what is your take uh, in such a patient when the patient comes to you? Yeah. So I generally uh, definitely I mean prefer solid biopsy and uh, send for EGFR Alcross uh, PDL one because the turnaround time is quite good. But if the patient is stable, asymptomatic, uh, we do have these good uh, coupons panels uh, provided by uh, AstraZeneca for lal paths. I think I've used for four or five patients where they do hotspot of multiple uh, mutations. So right. that is also not a bad option if you have enough time and the patient is fairly stable, or maybe uh, you are starting the patient on palliative radiation for. bone mets uh, meanwhile the ngs can uh, get processed otherwise the turnaround time of egfr alcross uh, pdl1 is good enough for me i wait i do not start chemotherapy unless the patient is very symptomatic so dr, dr. mansi have you faced issues with the tissue that is the tissue being inadequate and when you send for only egfr alcross and uh, nothing comes and you want to send an ngs have you found this issue coming yes that sometimes happens but though now uh, you know even our interventional radiologists are well uh, aware that when it is a lung biopsy they take multiple cores but there is still sometimes you know one one of cases where uh, it's not a very accessible lesion and you've just managed to get a small bit that's when ngs comes to rescue for sure right, right. dr rudresh same problem sometimes Issue is yeah. the issue, and do you subject these patients again to a rebiopsy because you want to find the a met BRAF and or do you rely on the liquid biopsy in such patients? No, usually uh, the uh, I think in lung uh, getting the tissue is one of the very difficult task compared to any other uh, solid tumors. Uh, right. Usually I will do with TJ for all cross and PDL one. If anyone is comes positive, I. don't prefer to do if tissue is uh, inadequate i am not uh, you know putting the patient for another test i will start the treatment i will start the treatment only if patient is symptomatic initially with chemotherapy right. if right. patient is asymptomatic there is no other issues i will be waiting for 5 to 7 days to get the report all right so uh, i'll start with you again dr rudresh now yeah. that we've heard about let's forget for a time being only for a time being that this patient was metastatic suppose this patient is in uh, early lung cancer do you call for mutation analysis in such a patient yeah preferably i want to do it right 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 dr abe all, all lung cancer mutation analysis early now not uh, not all tests only i will do uh, egf for all right so so very interestingly uh, i'll ask you the same question because you you raked up that question regarding the liquid biopsy so uh, how much is the concordance between the tissue and the liquid uh, because i think you would have had experience on that so i think it is around uh, it uh, 70 to 80% okay right 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 i think uh, 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 liquid biopsy is the alternative to what uh, we we have so right right so uh, uh, so this patient was found to have l858r mutation so i'll start with dr smitha so dr smitha uh, a bu- buff- buffet of treatments are there what is your choice in this patient we've not yet done an mri so we are not going there as of now so this patient where it was so usually we start with either of the tkis so right. ideally the preferred is osimertinib but usually right. most of us start with the first line gefitinib or erlotinib Right. Afatinib personally uh, will not use much, and dacamatinib right. also because of the availability, not availability, not much. So, Dr. Smitha, you have started your patient, like you mentioned, on chemotherapy while awaiting the report, and the patient is on chemotherapy. So, what do you do when you get this L eight five eight R? So, what is so, what do you uh, do? Based on the Tata study, so there was yes. evidence that you can continue with the chemotherapy. You add the uh, TKI. and it did show a benefit with the pfs so right. if the patient was symptomatic and we had started chemotherapy i would add the tk along with the, this thing and probably right. once the patient achieves after four cycles after the reassessment you can continue the tk as maintenance 
Right, right, right. Dr. Lepakshi, your, 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 your take on this. You, so, have not, you have not started your treatment. I, I think that is what I, I got from your first question because you'll wait for the report. Or, or is it you also start your chemotherapy? Uh, I will start with chemotherapy, sir. Okay, Till so I now you the have reports. this report. What do you do next? So I will go with uh, Jeffrey with chemotherapy. Right, right. So I think uh, both of you agree that is where it is. So Dr. Mansi, you have not started your chemotherapy, if, if I'm correct. Yeah, I generally reserve, I mean, unless the patient is very symptomatic. So, so this patient is not that symptomatic. So what is your take? So my uh, first option, provided patient has finances, has always been osimertinib since it's become the standard of care. And I'm very right. happy with the results. Uh, of course, all just about 20 to 30% of my patients can afford osimertinib. Um, but the rest, I start on jefitinib. The second drug I prefer is jefitinib uh, after osimertinib based on the tolerable. Uh, and afatinib has been pathetic. I have used them, uh, used it initially uh, because long ago when, uh, you know, uh, during our training days, we had this idea. We were waiting for Lux Lung 7 uh, data and we were like, oh, no, no, you're doing a disservice to the patient by not offering afatinib. But we've never been able to give full doses. It always is stopped. You start at 20 and you just, you do a disservice to the patient by giving that drug. So for me, it's osimertinib. If not that, jeftinib. So hopefully the generic form of afatinib is less effective and less toxic now than, and much cheaper also. So probably we can try. But what I wanted to ask you again was this patient is L858R. So does that change your treatment? There what? is something, there is data from the relay trial regarding the erlotinib plus the Cyramza study and they have yes. shown shown uh, a good response. So is that important? Is the L858R mutation also important? So it was important at one point, but osimertinib works across all mutations, including T790M. So if my patient can afford osimertinib, I mean, uh, if my patient can afford Cyramza, they can definitely afford osimertinib. So I would still go for osimertinib. All right. All right. <laughs> Dr. Rudresh, your take. Yeah, patient is affordable, definitely I will start with osimertinib. If right. patient is not affordable, depending on the general condition, if general condition not that much great, I will start with jefitinib. If right. the performance status is very good, then I will add along with jefitinib the chemotherapy, which also uh, shown. Uh, right, right. So why why not erlotinib with bevacizumab? Erlotinib is cheap and bevacizumab is also uh, very, now a lot of bias, uh, what you call generic forms of bevacizumab. Why not this? No, will, 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 the, will it be the second option if the patient is not affordable for osimertinib? That is what I, I, I was trying to tell you. No, ask I you. don't think so. I, okay. If patient is not affordable for osimertinib, I think jefitinib plus chemotherapy is a better option. That also right, is right. almost as equal as yes. uh, osimertinib. Right, right, right. I, I totally agree. I totally agree. The survivors were. Dr. Abe, I think I'll come back to you now. Your take. Right. Actually, uh, whether we use uh, uh, TKI with either uh, so the Jeff inhibitor or chemotherapy, I think toxicity profile a little bit different. But uh, so even the combination of uh, TKI plus target anti vegf is more toxic. So if right. it is a combination, I prefer Jeffitinib with the chemotherapy. Right. So I think we all agree it is either the third generation TKI or it is either the first generation TKI and we no, no longer use the first generation TKI alone. It is with a combination. But yes, interesting to see data maturing from other trials where L858R uh, has been told. So, so rightly said, I think osimertinib is the preferred option, but there are other options which are there. And I think uh, as we go forward, we'll keep discussing uh, how to go about it. So, uh, 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 starting again now with Dr. Uh, Abe again. Dr. Abe, suppose you are given these four choices and only, only given to pick one. So, which will be your choice for considering the first line treatment option? So, I think uh, for specifically in this condition, so overall survival is important because right. all other medications have shown so they are all safe. They have shown PFS benefit. I think overall survival makes the difference in this particular setting. Uh, Dr. Smitha, 
I'll, I'll give you I'll give you two choices, not one this time. I'll give you two choices. So I, I'll be a little biased to the ladies here. So uh, <laughs> OS is what uh, Dr. Abbe said. So I think uh, yeah, OS is important and also efficacy. Both of them are important for me. Right, right, right. So right. in stage four, you are trying to get the best OS. So that is why the OS is important. And we also are looking for a response because right. if you have a good response, that will continue forwards. Dr. Lepakshi? It's uh, both efficacy and OS. Okay, okay. Dr. Mansi? Uh, I would differ with my uh, friends and colleagues. Uh, OS and quality of life because OS anyway reflects efficacy. Quality of life is what we should aim at in you know metastatic setting, and it also reflects safety. Uh, if the quality of life is good, it shows that it's a safe drug. So those are my two. Very uh, smart. I think I, I think that's a that's a very very smart uh, answer because uh, if you if the if the drug is safe, you itself have a good quality of life, and if it is efficacious, you have a good overall survival. So yes, so you ticked all four boxes indirectly. So Dr. Rudresh, uh, similar. Yeah, yeah, definitely. All four are very much important. If right. OS is improved and quality of life is not good, then but uh, efficacy is good. OS will benefit. O OS will yes. be more. And if, if it is safe, uh, quality of life also will improve. Definitely all the fours are important, not one. Yes, yes. So, so Dr. Rudirish, if you see that the, these were what we had, the erlotinib was better than jefitinib. And uh, uh, somehow, as you see in the Lux Lung 7, hardly any difference between uh, the jefitinib and the afatinib. The archers showed that the dacometinib was better than jefitinib, but it excluded the brain metastasis. And when it comes to the osimertinib, there was a significant improvement in the survival. And I think uh, this is something significant. But what is important to know is the brain metastasis. Uh, majority of the studies excluded brain metastasis, especially the symptomatic brain metastasis. The archers totally excluded the brain okay. metastasis. So that is something that goes against the uh, archer study. So uh, will the type of mutation change your choice of EGFRT? And probably it's, it's, it's a revision of uh, what I asked you before. So I'll ask Dr. Rudresh this question. So exon 19, exon 20, and exon uh, 21 L858R. So uh, three different mutations, your drug of choice. I think exon 19 and 21 uh, uh, almost the uh, same, whatever the TKA is. Right. But the exon 20 is right. a bit resistant to right. TKAs. In that case, right. only I would think otherwise exon 19 and 21 both are uh, response to TK. If the chance is given to me, definitely I will go with Osimatic. Right. Dr. Abhay, 19, 21, and 20. What do you do for 20, Dr. Abhay? Actually, uh, so for 19, 21, there's no difference. It is osimertinib. Right. And uh, 20, again, uh, so if there is specific 20 insertion mutation, then there are many newer drugs are available. But as of now, it is only theoretical, not yet available for India, like that is mevantinib. So otherwise, other rare mutations, uncommon mutations, my preference of choice is afatinib. Yeah, right. So Dr. Abhay, I just wanted to ask you, the L858R, does the chemotherapy or the data protocol work better than OC Martin? Any, any experience on that? Um, See, because osimertinib is giving you 14.4 months of treatment uh, of, and which is very, very low as compared to the Exxon 21. So any data over there that you have? Otherwise, I'll ask Dr. Smitha because she would have done something like this at k 2 No, no, not aware. Not study that data protocol. So, so uh, Dr. Smitha, I'm back to you. No, uh, we are having a study presently, but right. uh, we have not looked at the specific sub uh, uh, exon 19 versus l 8 r mutation. We have not looked at that. Right. So I right. think yeah, that is your... As per your what is seen, definitely Exxon 19 did the best. Okay, so what do you do for Exxon 20? Tata, Tata study, I think they have not uh, subcategorically mentioned about they the have not. different they EGFR have not. mutations. Right. right. So Exxon 20, Dr. Smitha, what do you do? As of now, we are giving chemotherapy. Uh, if it or osimertinib only for reimbursement patients. Right, right. Dr. Lepakshi, your take mutations. 
for exam 19 and uh, 21 uh, pan generation tk for okay. exam 20 it is osimertinib okay so so what is your drug of choice suppose you start these patients on osimertinib and the patient progresses what is your way to go forward in the second line uh, in such a patient uh, again to you dr lipakshi so if the patients patients progress on osimertinib then i will prefer chemotherapy right and uh, if they are affordable then based on uh, im power uh, you will add atazolizumab with bevacizumab right right dr mansi first line osimertinib so generally um, if it is or do you just, sequence or, it no i i use first line osimertinib as far as possible if the patients can afford and if there is just oligo uh, you know metastatic or very uh, minimal progression we try to uh, uh, treat the local site and continue osimertinib as far as possible i've tried yes. to drag a few patients uh, like that for more than 6 months also and uh, after that um, it is it is an open house you can pick whatever so i generally I tend to pick chemo especially pemcarbo because it's well tolerated that's the very reason i avoid using uh, chemotherapy up front because it's a well tolerated regimen which we can use later on so, so do, do yeah you continue the or osimertinib with the chemo or do you stop the osimertinib no then i stop once i switch right. i stop right 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 dr rudresh your take progression on osimertinib second line yeah yeah it is depending on the number of lesion and uh, the yeah. symptoms if uh, very few lesions definitely i will uh, treat with local therapy and i will continue right. osimertinib right. if i am right. doing otherwise uh, i will usually i'll switch over to chemotherapy as uh, pemcarbo is one of the least toxic uh, drug what i come across very few right. toxic right. so there is data regarding that c797s mutation which is there which causes resistance to osimertinib and there is some data that in such patients geftinib somehow works so i think worth worth seeing so uh, this slide uh, shows that osimertinib has the over highest overall response rate and the median Uh, the, uh, so, how important is is the overall survival? And I think you all answered. So, I'll I'll just uh, skip to that. And as you can see from the Flora trial, the overall survival was best with osimertinib. And the Archers also showed a improvement uh, of that. But most importantly, it did not have patients with brain metastasis. So, something that is against the Archers trial uh, and dexamethinib. So, th- this was the phase three trial. So, oh. yeah now coming to uh, the point which was which was there while choose, choosing the egfr tki can you ignore risk of developing cns metastasis we know that cns metastasis may be present in 25% of individuals and 50% as lifetime risk so i'll go to dr rudresh only uh, so dr rudresh important yeah no 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 i will yeah. not uh, you know ignore it is one of the very right. important site of medicine cnl i always right. keep, keep it in mind So, so Dr. Rudresh, asymptomatic brain meds only osimertinib, or would you like to irradiate this patient? Secondly, symptomatic brain meds only osimertinib or radiation. If patient is asymptomatic and there is no other issues, I will continue with osimertinib. I will see for the response. If response right. is good, I will continue. If patient is symptomatic, usually, if possible, uh, um, stereotactic radio surgery or local therapy, if possible, I will do it. Then I will continue with osimertinib. I think bang on you are, Doctor Abhay. I'll take your call on this. So I think I think you should agree with what. Yeah, definitely. If patient is asymptomatic, uh, then uh, so then uh, we'll continue osimertinib. So only if patient right. is symptomatic and uh, limited metastasis SRS. Otherwise, if it is extensive metastasis, then uh, whole brain artery. So Doctor Abhay, the num are the number of brain meds important? Whether they are sim. Suppose he has multiple brain meds and patient is asymptomatic. Is that important? Is a is a single brain metastasis? Is it's, the number not, of brain meds important? It's not. It's not. But it's only important for the treating it. Just for the to prevent the neurotoxicity. If the number right. of uh, even if there is a multiple brain metastasis, if the patient is asymptomatic, then still we can treat with only osimertinib. There is no need of no need to treat. No need to hurry to treat the. Uh, brain lesions with the RT. Only thing is that it makes difference only whether if patient is symptomatic whether we are able to preserve the 
so uh, other normal brain area whether to do by srs or whole brain rt right right so so uh, i'll come to dr smita dr smita how has been your experience using osimertinib with asymptomatic brain meds and then you have not given rt to these patients how have has your been experience been so usually the osimertinib as is having a good cns penetration and usually we see very good response so for patients right. who are not is i mean uh, symptomatic and uh, they usually the progression of the development of the brain meds is delayed for a longer time and even patients who have had asymptomatic patients with brain meds so they also have responded well to osimertinib but right, at, right. at some point they will progress so any patient uh, dr smita because i you see so many patients at kidway who who you started on osimertinib and within two months the patient has progressed in the brain i had one so that is why i really want to know no i uh, not we didn't have any osimertinib started patients who had progressed on only uh, the brain but right. uh, yeah there was another reimbursement patient which uh, the right. patient had a leptomeningeal disease and so i that think is that is always bad yes yeah, so that was a bad thing yeah Yeah, yeah, that is always bad. Doctor Lepachi, your your take on the same question. Yeah, in the asymptomatic brain meds, uh, so I will consider osimertinib only. Right. So how how long how long do can you keep these patients asymptomatic with brain with brain meds with osimertinib? How 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 which has been your longest patient? It's almost. They will about, progress uh, eventually. They yeah. will progress in the brain eventually. We know that. So which has been your longest? I'll tell you, I had a patient who progressed within one and a half months. That is my shortest I know. So, so it's about sixteen to eighteen months. Oh wow, wonderful, wonderful! I I I know that the, 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 yeah. there is data, and even the westernized data says that these patients can be kept for anywhere between twelve to eighteen months. Doctor Mansi, uh, your take? Ah, uh, so I just wanted to add one point. There is there is some data where. when symptomatic meds or when there is mild progression on atmg you can increase the dose of osimertinib to 160 mg okay. i had a patient where i was thinking of doing that uh, hoping that astrazeneca will give at the same uh, cost but then it was doubling and they couldn't afford it but there is yes. good data on on that and uh, another one of my patient i mean fortunately or unfortunately uh, they reached me after a, a surgery um, for the brain meds they had a solitary brain uh, she had a solitary brain lesion and generally i don't send for metastatectomy but she underwent that and she came back and she's doing really well right uh, so on osimertinib we have all heterogeneous patients i have never tried a 160 mg those ever i don't think anybody in our panel would have also but here some something for as we go along toxicity is uh, keeping in mind uh, so dr to, yeah to add to dr mansi i think there was one that leptomeningeal patient i said no so that yes, particular yes. patient uh, when i had gone through the review of literature for leptomeningeal they recommend 160 mg right to be in a bd dosage uh, there is But a there is a data blue study bloom study is there in that data one they used either uh, weekly I, weekly erlotinib uh, 10 times the dose or uh, the 160 mg of uh, 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 osimertinib so it has shown good improvement good response rate nearly around 70% response is it so dr abid did they give some intrathecal injections also to these le- leptomeningeal diseases or did they incorporate rt also to such patients i think uh, only uh, continued uh, uh, osimertinib okay what something very wonderful i have not come across i think something to learn from this yeah. uh right uh, so dr rudesh a question for you do you routinely do a brain mri for all stage 4 uh, even if not symptomatic i think the answer should be yes dr rudesh am i audible yeah most of you are asking routinely for all the uh, lung yes. cancer patients all stage 4s uh, not much ncc has mm-hmm. recommends anything beyond stage 3 you should ideally yeah, yeah i know but uh, most of the symptomatic patients we are doing okay but uh, asymptomatic some patients if right. uh, ct scan not done if there is no other lesion we may think otherwise no dr abhi 
So actually, ideally, it should be supposed to be uh, done. But uh, when I will do PET CT scan, I will see the lesions in the brain. So okay. PET CT itself. Yeah. So right. not PET CT scan shows some everything. lesion. PET CT scan pick up some lesion. Then I will go for uh, MRI brain. Okay, Doctor Smita. Doctor Smita. Usually, uh, we should do the. You are asking the question about brain MRI, right? Yes, yes. Are you doing it for all yeah. your patients, stage four? Mostly. Not for everybody, but yeah, almost more than sixty percent we are doing it. All right, yeah, yeah, so, right. So NCC and says you should, and uh, so we also don't do it all, but we try to get a CT with a contrast in majority of our patients, and uh, at least try to do that. But because we need to decide on the treatment in the base, because lung meds are an important uh, uh, factor when we start our treatment. So I think we should try to at least do a CT scan uh, for our patients. So uh, this was the various trials. I'm not half into that because I want to know from the, all of you. So hypothetical scenario, and uh, I'll, uh, I'll go to Dr. Lipakshi. Uh, would pdl one positivity favor in starting IO in this patient upfront? So we have the data from... Uh, uh, the pair of Packley, I think it was Packley Carbo and uh, the yeah, IO. Dose. Yes. So the patient uh, uh, fortunately has two mutations, the EGFR and the IO. So IO, now for this patient. Yeah. Uh, could you mute? Excuse me, could you mute, mute the people and the background? So, if the patient progressed on OSM, no, no, no. I am saying first line hypothetical. No, we don't have data. So, the, the patient was started on PEM Cargo and you suddenly get a PDL1 and EGFR. So, would you, would anybody start an IO for this patient in the presence of EGFR? No. Uh, Dr. Mansi? No, EGFR uh, takes uh, precedence. Yes. So I, th I think you're uh, bang on because we've seen from all the studies, if you have a target, the I IO is defeated. So you first target that therapy rather than go for the IO. The IO can always be kept for the subsequent lines. So uh, we know that and there was, was one thing. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. What is the percentage of uh, both uh, being positive? I think those are all mutually exclusive. No, it's. I, I don't think uh, it is. It is now the factor maybe for less, maybe less one. than one percent. No, uh, yeah. So uh, I don't know the uh, percentage, but PDL one with EGFR can is not necessarily mutually exclusive. Yes, EGFR ALK maybe, but I don't think so. PDL one. I would love to know from the house. I have two patients uh, yeah. who's. I mean, generally, when you want PDL one, it will not be positive in squamous <laughs> or. But I have two patients whose EGFR was positive and PDL1 is more than 50%. So I have I, mean... <laughs> I have two patients myself. I have two patients myself. So that is why I kept this question also. Uh, uh, so uh, with and I started them on chemo and added Jeftinib. It works easy on the pocket of the government. So that is what I did. So uh, uh, so I think uh, Dr. Abid, they, they are not mutually exclusive because we had also done a study in my previous place where I was at yeah. Delhi Army Hospital and in NGS yeah. we found found the, uh, them to coexist. So, yeah. Sir, definitely, PDL1 is not a uh, mutually exclusive with uh, any uh, oncogenic yes. drivers. Right. And also there is a data that uh, when you use osimertinib post IO, there is a more toxicity with osimertinib. Even they, they won't Absol recommend also. Absolutely, yes, absolutely. There, there is definitely. So you you should never do that. You should use your EGFR upfront. So how important is the safety profile, uh, uh, Dr. Abe? Do yeah, you keep that in mind? So all most of the first generation and third generation are uh, most safe. Commonly, we see come across is sometimes rash with the jeftinib most commonly what we use that one so but the right. rash is a little bit more common with the erlotinib we have not seen any much diarrhea with the whether first generation or third generation and right. also what they mention is regarding QT prolongation and not come across in osimertinib group so osimertinib is more well tolerable but i have seen a lot of problems with the afatinib so definitely right. 
so uh, one of the patient who has got uh, very uncommon uh, uncommon mutation that is multiple two mutations were there that patient i started on uh, 30 mg but patient is tolerated the so patient uh, escalated to 40 mg patient is tolerating so but the main problem issue is the uh, regarding the rash and diarrhea right so dr smita osimertinib safe to use or is there any any subset where you have not used osimertinib because of the toxicity and changed over to something else uh, most of my patients who have been received osimertinib very safe relatively well tolerated right so i am not aware of any right that much of toxicity dr lepakshi so most of the patients are well tolerated but uh, one of my patient had uh, great to ild Okay, so that resolved with steroids. Okay, and then you restarted uh, the patient on osimertinib in the same dose, or did you uh, escalate the dose from a lower level? So, patient itself uh, was taking an alternate day. Okay, ATMG okay. alternate right. day. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, yeah. so, so you raised a very interesting point. This alternate day uh, regime. So, so Dr. Mansi, I I heard you saying you are not happy with the uh, afatinib and dexamethinib. So have you ever tried the alternate day of these drugs uh, the diarrhea and all is considerably low if you give them alternate day but what's the point if you don't yeah. they are supposed to be efficacious at full doses so i Absolutely. i still stay away from them uh, right. with osimertinib rightly said by uh, dr lepakshi uh, if there is a, a, a you know already uh, uh, evident ild you should not be starting it i lost one patient uh, not with osimertinib with trisotinib she had metabolic cr but she had horrible ild and then from then on you know i keep checking for ild before i start any targeted therapy so. yeah I, i totally agree trisotinib ild as well as pulmonary edema patients do very badly some of them so yeah. so oh, i i totally agree so so dose reduction as you can see was lowest in the flora trial so a very very easy to use drug is what osimertinib is and uh, uh, so dr rudresh quality of life does it matter you, you said yes you said all four of them all so, four are important if yes. if, if, if the efficacy is good uh, os will improve and if it is uh, effective and uh, if it is safe definitely quality of life will improve So, so, Doctor Rudresh, the quality of life is best with the first generation TKIs. Uh, See, my experience, and, yeah, my experience with the first generation is uh, maybe around uh, eight to ten years. So, I never uh, come across a lot of toxicity with uh, gefitinib or uh, mostly gefitinib. Except right. uh, I stopped the tablet in a year, maybe one or two patients because of the toxicity with gefitinib. Was it Martini? We started using maybe one or two years. So. to wait right i i i think the quality of life we all agrees the best with first generation but we know that they cannot work in alone they have to have a partner along yeah. with that so uh, so uh, doctor uh, doctor rahul one sorry to interrupt no no so please please i would not agree that both are i mean first generation is better i think they are equivalent and unless you are counting financial uh, financial toxicity as quality of life I think... yes that i kept it separately <laughs> but definitely when it comes to financial toxicity then the, the things shifts definitely towards the first generation yes yes but if you see in the flora trial the quality of life was not worse with osimertinib so i think uh, and even in in my experience so far whichever few patients i have used it's okay it's fairly tolerated i have not seen a problem with the tolerance of the drug as such all right Uh, because doctor murli has scared us regarding the venous thrombus and we are already scared of the venous thrombus with the a co- ongoing covid so uh, uh, that that's why i thought i'll just put it i, I think dosimertinib is something that we have uh, uh, worked with so uh, so do, do we start osimertinib in the maximum possible dose or do we uh, start it in a lower dose and escalate doctor abbe your take no full dose only Full day also. Most right. of the time, what right. happens when we start the patient? They will come after six months, eight months like that. The drug. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Doctor Smita, full dose. Dose. Full dose. I don't know. Uh, paying patients, they run off when you tell them the cost of the full dose. So, uh, uh, Doctor Lepakshi, have you so have you tried? Really... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's full dose. Full dose only. Right. Right. Uh, so, uh, Doctor Mansi. 
do they ask you the the the, the cost of the full dose uh, i i don't give any any other option uh, i mean uh, i mean it's either that or first generation i don't give them an option of alternate day dose so so okay. it is full dose and of course they keep uh, my patients unfortunately keep calling me every month if there is any discount if there are any new offers <laughs> they don't right. disappear at all <laughs> <laughs> so, oh right, right. Uh, so, and there is no. I I wish there was a, a a patient assistance program where after you know ten months or one year there was some a uh, discount like our CDK four six inhibitors. But no, these patients don't get that. Yeah, I, Astra is listening. So Astra, something, Doctor Rudresh, full dose. Yeah, yeah, full dose only. If they are not right. affordable, I will not start one. You will not start. okay so so uh, uh, wonderful so you let me to the my last question so in in these patients do you not start the patient on anything or would you like to sequence these patients and give them something else and then probably osimertinib so when would you consider sequence sequencing approach dr rudresh should there yeah yes uh, sequencing of tks obviously yeah so we are not give, give, uh, giving osimertinib there first uh, we give, so when will you consider sequencing the tkis so if first line if i am using gefitinib or uh, erlotinib i will if patient progresses then i will check for any uh, specific mutation right then uh, depending on that i will may sequence otherwise uh, it is the same for all okay so dr abhay finances is it an important thing a uh, seek for sequencing you can can you can start the patient on afatinib and probably a, at least keep the patient with yourself and then give osimertinib in the second line what i basically mean to say is the cost yeah definitely uh, sequencing is important but uh, uh, more important is first all patients will give the option of osimertinib definitely if patient is so not affordable then we keep the option of uh, sequencing so even though in sequencing also so there is a 10 months the pfs benefit is there even the patient has to use for minimum of like 10 months so i have very bad experience in the second line osimertinib right. right. so what the right. most of the times what happens 30 to 40% patient may not reach to second line only so that's why it's right. always better right. to use the best drug in the first line absolutely yes. i agree so dr smita sequencing you get t790m in the in the second line when the patient is treated with either first or second line so so would you like to sequence and do you discuss the sequencing with your patients usually uh, see the patient is affordable up front go with the osimertinib in the first line and then right. at a later date you can always challenge them with chemotherapy right. for a patient who is not uh, financially sound always will go with the first line and keep osimertinib as a option for the uh, t790m mutation or at progression right right So you'll agree, first line osimertinib has better result compared to yes. st- sequencing strategy. Do you agree with this? Yes, agree with it. Yes. But only thing is, I think uh, if this is an ideal situation, so right? We are not in the ideal situation in the practice. Suppose, suppose you want to sequence Dr. Lipakshi. What will be your sequence in this patient? So either uh, erlotinib with bevacizumab followed by. was am written if t790 rm positive then chemo right dr mansi sequencing this patient uh so as as i have said earlier osimertinib up front sequencing right. i only reserve for patients who are poor and i i tell them that you know maybe a, a year down the line maybe the cost of this drug will go down and then you will benefit from this drug that's the only time when i uh right. choose right. sequencing Right, right, right. Dr. Rudresh, sequencing. Suppose. Yeah, definitely. I will if they are affordable. Osimertinib is the first line. Right. Then, uh, if they are not affordable, then gefitinib. Right, right, and right. So I think we we do agree that uh, patients by the time they come to second line, uh, they are already drained out physically as well as many times financially, and their motivations are not that great. So it is always better to. throw your best foot forward and give osimertinib in these patients and this is what the study was and uh, only very few received second or third line considerably lower numbers receiving the second line so the geotag study which is told about afatinib i'll not go into this because of paucity of time and these are my conclusions and we all know about 
OC Martinet, the PFS and the OS benefit, especially the CNS. And even after three years, 28% of the patients remained on OC Martinet. So this is something we can take uh, pride in. So OC Martinet has a favorable toxicity like we all discussed. And despite prolonged exposure also, we know how to manage these toxicities. So this is my conclusion. And uh, uh, this was my last slides. And uh, thank you very much to all my panelists, Dr. Abe, Dr. Smitha, Dr. Lipakshi, Dr. Mansi, and Dr. Rudresh for being a part of it. If there are any questions for any of them, I think they'll be happy to take it. So I will ask one question. Right. So everybody. So yes. do, in, uh, in, in lung cancer, adjuvant chemotherapy, stage 1B, so everybody will use adjuvant chemotherapy or uh, not? That is one question. And second one is, in adjuvant, what is the best protocol you use with chemotherapy? Right. So uh, if I can answer, uh, we, 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 we try to give adjuvant chemotherapy as per the ANITA trial, but we do not give venorelpin to our patients. We, we, we usually use a our conventional paclitaxel plus uh, platinum based as adjuvant. That is what we do. And we do it for the high risk patients. And uh, the definition of high risk, I think in early, early lung cancer is different from different uh, people. Uh, so, but we give it, especially in the high risk patients. I, I think Dr. Mansi, I can see. I, I agree with you, Dr. Rahul. So, right. Though I, I do tend to give Pemetrexate also, right. um, but otherwise I agree. Right. I think number of cases detecting stage 1B, I think very, very less. Maybe in a year 1, maybe 2, in a, uh, correct, no? Not very. With, with COVID, uh, fortunately, it has increased because of the screening protocols. Uh, we did pick up in the first and second wave a lot of stage 1 lung cancers, which I've never in all my life picked up. Yes, we all come across this. I think we picked up so many. And I think uh, the role of uh, low-dose CT, where we've got it done in our COVID patient, should come into practice and I think uh, first speaker, Dr. Narayanan, also mentioned about it because of, I think, finances, because of awareness and because of uh, majority of the people not having the access to low dose, uh, they are getting missed. And I think this is something that needs to be incorporated. We've, we've learned from COVID and picked up so many cases of lung masses. And uh, I think uh, this should definitely be incorporated. This should be a screening test. Right, right. So, thank you, sir. Uh, uh, thank, you, sir. thank you, all the panelists and Rahul, sir. I request you to kindly to give a vote of thanks. Yeah, so I think I have already given a vote of thanks. So, uh, again, I start from the back. I thank Dr. Rudresh, Dr. Marsi, Dr. Lipakshi, Dr. Smitha, and Dr. Abe for being a sport and uh, uh, listening to my boring questions and whatever. Uh, thank you so much for interacting. I've learned a lot from the panel. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Uh, Murli for his talk. Uh, uh, again, uh, uh, Dr. Prasad Narayan, he had to leave. Uh, uh, he messaged me he had to leave. And Dr. Narayanan, who's our uh, young budding uh, chess physician uh, to uh, consent for giving a talk. Uh, uh, so thank you so very much. And thank you to the organizers. Um, that is Horizon. And thank you to AstraZeneca, uh, who have always uh, helped us out in this. And uh, lung cancer will always remain a challenge. And uh, that is why uh, we are so excited to learn from each other on those fronts. And uh, mm, that's all from my end and over to the organizers. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Dr. Rahul. Thank Good you. night. So indeed, we had a wonderful thank you. thank you. We close the meeting, sir. Thank you, sir. Hello, support team. Can we now close? Sure, sir. Yeah, we can close the meeting for everyone now.